a última cirurgia médica. Okay, just give me a second, please, as I try to share my screen. Okay, good morning once again, chat. Uh, I wish morning. to say what I'm I'd like to say what good I'm morning, sir. I'm breaking the bread of life. Let us sum ourselves for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful morning. We thank you for the breath of life. We thank you for all the blessings bestowed upon us. As we're going to share the word of God and break the bread of life, we kindly ask you to send us your Holy Spirit to come and do it in our hearts as we listen to your word and may it be our guide. For in your holy name we are prayed. Amen. Uh, Amen. The title of a sermon is, is doing what's right under pressure. What does it mean to be under pressure? We can all share. Being under pressure, it could mean that you're stressed. You have a lot on your mind. And we're all aware that once you're under pressure, nobody performs well. Yes, you may feel more creative when we are under the gun, but the feeling not a reality. Performing under pressure is quite hard for every one of us. We're all aware of that. So what does it mean to do right under pressure? What causes pressure in most men? They could be final, fin this is financial problems, non final problems. Most men get stressed when they don't have money in their pocket. Pressure could be caused by work. It could be having pressures from your workplace. You could have lost your job or your salary could have gone down. That causes pressure in most men. It could be personal relationships as well. There are people in all our lives that, there are people in our lives that co can cause us stress as well. It could be pressure from your partner. It could be pressure from your friends. There are numerous causes of stress in most romantic relationships. And of course, when couples are constantly under pressure, the relationship could be on the risk of failure. Parenting is also another cause of pressure we could look at. Parents often face pressure, especially when they're, Kids are turning close to their adolescent age. They don't know how to deal with them. Uh, uh, some parents can instead become harsh to their kids. Some can become authoritative in the interactions with their children. So parenting, parenting as well can cause also pressure. So our daily lives as well and our busy nature, busy schedules can also cause us pressure. The day to day stresses we go through can cause us a lot of pressure. The stress of being too busy is also getting more and more common these days. Personality and resources as well. Sorry, this was repeated. Let us try to look at some of the examples of men in the Bible who have failed under pressure. We can take an example of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve did not remain faithful to God but broke the commandment by eating the forbidden fruit. We may not be able to read the verse in the Bible because of time, but it's in Genesis 3, 1 to 7, where we find that Adam and Eve failed to, were not obedient to God because they ate of the forbidden fruit, having been tempted by, by the devil. They also were under pressure, so they were not able to do right. Moses is also another example who was not able to lead his people to the promised land because of their grumbling. At a particular low moment when the people are complaining about the food, Moses lamented to God. We know how we lamented to God. He was very bitter. He was asked, why have you dealt ill with your servant? And it is he. Moses was dispirited and preferred to die rather than continue on his way. And in his weariness, he spoke rashly and God excluded him from leading the people into the promised land. We can also look at one incident of the waters of Meribah which is recorded in Numbers 20, 10 to 11. 
that was nearing the end of their 40 lives of wandering, that is the Israelites, they came to a desert of Zin. There was no water and the community turned against Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron went to the tent of meeting and prostrated themselves before God. God told Moses and Aaron to gather the assembly and speak to the rock. Water would come forth. Moses took the staff and gathered the men. Then seemingly in anger, Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came from the rock as God had promised. But God immediately told Moses and Aaron that because they failed to trust him enough to honor him as holy, they will not bring the children of Israel into the promised land. God had told Moses to speak to the rock, not to strike the rock with his staff. So in a way, this is also disobedience because he didn't obey the word of God. And he did what wasn't right because he was under pressure. Our focus today is going to be on King Saul. But let me read the verse again, which you read from 1 Samuel 13, verse 8 to 9. It reads, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So, so, so Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And you offered the burnt offering. Near the end of Samuel's life, the Israelites rejected Samuel's sons as judges of Israel and asked him to appoint a king over them. Samuel warned, warned them that a king would oppress them, but they, are, they chose to have one anyway. And that began the story of Israel's kings. So Samuel was the first king of Israel. That is how Samuel rose to the throne of, uh, of, uh, of the king of Israel. He was tall, you know, we have read about him, he was tall and some. And uh, at first, Saul appeared to make good decisions because he was still obedient to God. But soon he began to make some very bad choices and brought, God brought an end to his reign. Uh, in First Samuel 13, Saul and his army were waiting for Samuel to arrive to offer a sacrifice before going to war. That's what we see in the first verses of First Samuel 13. Samuel had not yet come, and the soldiers were preparing to flee rather than fight the Philistines. Growing impatient, Saul chose to offer a sacrifice on his own. Then just as Saul finished the sacrifice, Samuel arrives and says, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command of God. You have not kept the command the Lord gave you. That is in 1 Samuel 13, 13. Why was the offering? Why was the offering a sacrifice? Why was offering a sacrifice foolish? Well done that it was foolish for Saul to offer a sacrifice because he had disobeyed a direct command from the prophet Samuel given in 1 Samuel 10, 1 Samuel 10, 8. The command which was given to him in 1 Samuel 10, 8 by Samuel himself was go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship and, and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. These seven days were evidently to teach soul patience and dependence upon God. He waited the seven days, but just barely. As soon as the week was up, he he offered the sacrifice on his own, refusing to wait any longer for Samuel. In this presumptuous act, Saul showed a variety of weaknesses that made him unfit to be king, including impatience and self-reliance. His offering showed that he did not want to work together with Samuel or obey God. Rather, he wanted to take control of the situation himself. The king was to follow the Lord's commands, yet Saul felt he could do as he chose and thus made a foolish mistake. Uh, another indirect reason that Saul's action was wrong is that Saul was not a priest or a Levite. We all know that. Thus, he could not legally offer a burnt offering or peace offering. 
Remember, Saul was one of the tribe of Benjamin and was not to do the work of a priest. In any case, he was not a priest. However, the biblical text notes that the direct reason why Saul's sacrifice was sinful was that Saul disobeyed Samuel's command. Samuel was a prophet and a person of authority, and the word of the Lord had been spoken through him to Saul. So he did not simply disobey Samuel's, com Samuel's command, but he disobeyed God because this was the word of God, and God was speaking through Samuel, his prophet. In fact, King David, the king who followed Saul, offered a burnt sacrifice, burnt offering to the Lord, uh, as, as you may see in Second Samuel, which was that David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowships and fellowship offerings. In this case, however, David did so in disobedience, in obedience to the command of the prophet God. So, what lessons do we learn from Saul? There are so many valuable valuable lessons that we can learn from Saul's situation. First, it was clear that God, it's very clear that God desires us to be obedient to him. Second, patience is often needed to fully follow God's word. Third, there are negative consequences when we choose our own way instead of God's way. Uh, Uh, so we have seen how Saul was disobedient. As he was concluding the seven days, uh, Samuel had told him he couldn't, he couldn't wait but offer the burnt sacrifice because he was under pressure. Remember in the earlier verses how the Philistines had gathered in thousands of numbers. They, they had gathered in 10,000 of numbers and yet Saul had only 3,000 men. And out of the 3,000, he had stayed with 2,000. The 1,000 had gone with Jonathan his son. So the Philistines for them were in 30,000, uh, 10 times as bigger than as his army. And realizing that he also his men, his soldiers were, were had started uh, complaining and the numbers had become small, he got a lot of pressure thinking that, uh, that he was going to be attacked by the Philistines. Having, uh, having suffered this pressure, he decided to offer a burnt a sacrifice to the Lord, and yet he was not a Levite, and neither was he a priest. Uh, we have seen these lessons which I've shared with you. But what we learn as well, that in terms of stress, substituting personal agendas and human effort for trusting disobedience, and obedient faith is like a skydiver dispensing with a parachute and substituting flapping his arms. We all know how a parachute uh, works. When you're flying the sky, they use it to fly in the sky. So substituting, dispensing a parachute, uh, the substituting the flapping of arms can cause a parachute to, to, to land, which may be trouble for the person who is flying it. Uh, when we look at other scriptures to see how some people some other Bible scholars have, were not able to, or able to do right under pressure. We can look at Numbers 18, 7, 18, 1 to 7. We may not read the, all the verses, but it tells us that God had given Aaron his descendants from the tribe of Levi stewardship over the tabernacle, sanctuary, and the altar. These are simply some verses which you might read during your free time. Then 2 Chronicles 26, 16 to 21 speaks of Uzziah. And the but let us look at this second chronicles. If we can open our Bible, second chronicles. Second chronicles twenty six. Second Chronicles 26, second, a second, please. Second Chronicles 26, 16 to 21, it reads, but when he was strong in his heart, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. 
for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn his sins on the altar of, inc of his, his incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead, forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And, and Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust, so they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. You can see, you can see what happened to Uzziah when he was under pressure. He thought that going in to, 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 to burn his sense on the altar was the best thing he could do because he was under pressure, but what he did wasn't right. Then uh, Psalms 57 to 15 shows us that God's desire is for our worship and praise towards him to be more important than burnt offerings. He wants our whole heart, mind, body, and soul fixed on him. Uh -huh. Acts 13, 21, 23 reminds us of God's love for David and said to be a man after his own heart, a man full of integrity and honesty that pleased God throughout his life. Uh, what does God desire of us? Looking at this, so looking at Saul's situation, I think I've seen that it is clear that God desires our obedience. Second, patience has to be exercised to fully follow God's word. And third, there are negative consequences when we choose our own way instead of God's way. It may not be easy or convenient. Obeying God's word is the best choice for our lives and for our service to others. As we conclude, I wrote these words of conclusion from the song which we know all very well. And it says, All soul, I weary and troubled. No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The second verse says that his word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. God bless you all, and thank you for listening. Amen.